Um, anyway, it's a joy to be with you, a joy to uh, be with my brother Scott and Josh, and that's just my prayer has been and will continue to be that you will hear the Lord speak through us. We have no sense that uh, our message is unique, but we do uh, certainly just want to be um, speaking on behalf of the, the living God. Just by way of introduction, just a brief introduction, um, I've been married to Sherry for uh, 27 years. We have three children, uh, two daughters who are uh, in their early 20s, both nurses, and so serving on the front lines in the hospitals, and uh, and a son who's 19. So we're thankful that they're all going on well for the Lord. So uh, turning your Bibles to Luke chapter 1, and uh, we'll begin uh, my topic, the topic that's been assigned to me is going back or going to, uh, down to ground zero. Um, I want to give maybe a little bit of a, a different picture um, with the, with the specific topic, but I think we'll end up in the in the same place. So uh, I'll give you a little just a picture in your mind, um, and then and then we'll just uh, commit our time to the Lord in a word of prayer. So I grew up here in southern Ontario uh, in a farming uh, part of the province, and uh, my father. Uh, we were on a a family farm of about six generations, and my father in the winter months would often use the time to uh, renovate or to update our old, our century old farmhouse. And uh, so he would uh, go to work and would strip away the old lath and plaster construction of this old farmhouse. And as you can imagine, it was quite a mess and he'd get everything back to the, the bare studs, everything cleaned up, um, kind of like in Nehemiah's day that we read about in Nehemiah 4 that all the rubble needed to be cleared away before the the rebuild could begin and uh, and then he would go on to build to construct or to renovate um, what he wanted and of course we know it would have been foolish to add a new layer on top of the old construction um, as he would tear away the the old walls often he would find something that needed to be realigned or or shimmed um, sometimes it looked like he was completely starting over and um, and so as as we heard already from our brother scott uh, we have a god who wants to build uh, we certainly know that he is at work in our lives uh, wanting to not simply to renovate but to form christ in us and so um, as we go to Luke chapter 1, uh, we want to see uh, some of the things that we um, see as basic essentials in the, in the life of the Lord Jesus. So let's just uh, pray and commit our time to the Lord, and then we'll, we'll go from there. Father, again, we just want to uh, quiet our hearts in your presence, uh, acknowledge our dependence upon you. Uh, apart from you, we can do nothing. And so we just uh, look to you, Father, to... Uh, open our hearts. Uh, we want to be hearers uh, and doers of your word. And so, Father, we just uh, commit these next minutes to you, and we pray that you would just give help uh, to present the message that you have laid on my heart. And we ask it uh, in the name of the Lord Jesus and for his glory. Amen. So as, as you can see, uh, as we all can see, Scott has alluded to it, uh, we don't need a great deal of wisdom to understand this, that we're in a, a remarkable season of life, remarkably unique in so many ways. And the the perspective that I want to take uh, tonight as we're talking about these things is just that in the same way the winter season provided an opportunity for my father's renovation of an old farmhouse, I wonder if our Heavenly Father isn't wanting to use this season uh, to do a renovating work in our own lives. And so when our brother uh, contacted me uh, a week ago or so to ask about participating uh, in this little conference, my mind immediately went uh, to these verses in Luke chapter 1. Quite confident that this is what the Lord would have me to share with you uh, tonight. We see, we see here in the earliest chapters of the Gospel of Luke um, these important 
uh, basic essentials in the life of the Lord Jesus. We, we know that uh, the Lord Jesus would go on. Jesus of Nazareth, the Son of Man, would go on to have a, an extraordinary life and ministry. But it, but it all begins here in some of these early chapters. And I think the details that are given here by Dr. Luke are important. And so I want to look at, at Luke chapter 1 and going right to the beginning. This is the uh, angel speaking to Mary in chapter 1 and verse 31. He says, Behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son, and you shall call his name Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. He will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end. And then Mary said to the angel, How can this be, since I do not know a man? And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also that Holy One who is to be born will be called the Son of God. Someone has said that if you try to understand the incarnation, you will lose your mind. But if you deny it, you will lose your soul. The angel Gabriel here is answering Mary's question, how is this all going to work? And he says, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. And we know that's exactly what happened. The Holy Spirit came upon her. That We, we speak of a, a miraculous conception. But the Holy Spirit came upon this woman and imparted, and life was imparted instantaneously. And, and we know it uh, to be true that at the incarnation, God stepped into a human body. Nine months later, the Son of God would, would be born into this world. For, for a nine-month period, the Son of God was confined to the virgin womb. We find it hard to uh, comprehend that mystery that the God of the universe uh, would be confined in such a way. The eternal word becoming flesh. It's easy to get lost in the wonder of this moment. We sometimes sing the words meekness and majesty, manhood and deity, in perfect harmony with the man who is God. We remember the words of Solomon that the dedication of the temple, even the heaven of heavens cannot contain God. Yet in this newborn baby, Paul tells the Colossians dwelt all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Paul would write to Timothy and say, great is the mystery of godliness. God manifest in the flesh. And so as we read that and as we go on in the gospel account of Luke, we, it's easy to see and to, to say, what an extraordinary life. There was nothing, in one sense, ordinary about his life or about his work. He was unlike any other man who lived. It's easy to read about the Lord Jesus and to see how different he was to, to our lives. This is not how our story began. I don't think any of us have a miraculous conception of a virgin in your history. Rather, David speaks for all of us in Psalm 51 when he says, Behold, I was shapen in iniquity, and in sin my mother did conceive me. And so we were born into this world physically alive, but as Ephesians 2 reminds us, spiritually dead, dead in our trespasses and sins. Of course, Many of us, most of us, I trust here tonight, have heard and responded to the words of the Lord Jesus. You must be born again. Unless one is born again, you will not see the kingdom of God. And so for us who are saved, it's, it's easy. We've, in one sense, we've put our faith and our trust, our full confidence in the Lord Jesus for salvation we talk about being saved, we delight in our salvation, but so often then we go on to be satisfied with living an ordinary, normal life relative to those around us. We, we think about the same things, we buy the same things, 
We do the same things with our spare time. We go to the same places. We watch the same things. We fail to recognize that the one who we're reading about here in Luke 1, who lived this extraordinary life 2,000 years ago on this strip of land east of the Mediterranean, this one now lives inside of you and me. Paul the Apostle, as we know in Galatians 2, says it's no longer I who lives, but it's Christ who lives in me. And so as we think back to our conversion, our experience, and the moment when we were saved, it may not have felt overly dramatic to us. Some of us were so young when we were saved, and we may remember the relief of, of, of not going to a lost eternity. But, but we must remember and we must be reminded that this was a dramatic, miraculous event when God the Holy Spirit took up residence in your life and mine. Divine life planted in, implanted into our humanity. And so, of course, this, uh, these verses in Luke 1 describing the incarnation, uh, an exceptional historic event. But let's be reminded that your conversion story and mine is also an extraordinary event. And how is it possible that we would be satisfied then to live ordinary lives? And so again, going back to the, the picture of my father stripping away the layers of, of decorating and walls and, and construction to get back to the essentials, I wonder if this is an opportunity in this season uh, when, when all of the activity is being stripped away and all of the, the routine and the structure that has been a normal part of our lives, wonder as that is stripped away, maybe we need to go back to the wonder of what it means to be saved. So much more than just a, a judicial declaration, you're justified, you're forgiven, as if, if that wouldn't be enough. But if you and I have trusted the Lord Jesus and, and received him as, as Savior and Lord of our life, we have had the seed of divine life implanted within us. And so may God help us to recapture the, the wonder and the reality of what took place in our lives at that moment that we trusted him for salvation. We're brought from death to life. How is it that we could live ordinary lives when such an extraordinary thing has happened to us, that, that the, the very Spirit of God has been implanted into our life? And so no, we don't call it uh, the incarnation in that sense, of course, but we do have this extraordinary experience of the divine being implanted, the Spirit of God uh, being implanted into your life and mine. As we go on in these early chapters of, of Luke, just gaining an understanding of, of the Lord Jesus, the Son of Man, this Jesus of Nazareth in, in his humanity, we, we, we read about his, his birth at the end of chapter uh, 1 into chapter 2. We, we come to his baptism in chapter 3, and I just want to drop by uh, the verses in, in chapter 3 and verse 21 with, with little comment. But it says there, when all the people were baptized, it came to pass that Jesus also was baptized. And while he prayed, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven, which said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. The account goes on then in chapter 4 and verse 1. and says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil. In those days he ate nothing, and afterward when he had ended, he was hungry. They had ended, he was hungry. And so the first observation 
that that I wanted us to think of. The first essential is that of of divine life, and and then here in in chapter four, as we as we read these two statements together, he was filled with the Holy Spirit, and he was led by the Holy Spirit in the wilderness. Here we see that this was a man who was under divine control. And, and again, this is, this is an interesting um, thing to get our minds around, to try to really enter into, to understand that when the Lord Jesus was here on earth as the Son of Man, he was, he was fully subject to, he was fully surrendered to the Holy Spirit and to the leading of the Holy Spirit. He was fully obedient. He was fully submissive to his Father's will. Of course, when he returned to heaven, seated at the right hand, he, he would be doing the sending. He would send the Holy Spirit. But here in Luke chapter 4, we read that he being filled with the Holy Spirit was then led by the Spirit into the wilderness. We see uh, he was one under divine control. We would we read in John 5, we recall the words of the Lord Jesus there when he said, the Son can do nothing of himself. What he sees the Father do, for whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. He was one who was fully surrendered. He said, I have come to do thy will, O God. He was under authority. He learned obedience by the things that he suffered. He experienced, as we read here, the personal leading of the Holy Spirit. And so as we review the, the life and the, the ministry of the Lord Jesus, there was nothing of self in the mind or the heart or the will of Jesus of Nazareth that did not yield to his heavenly Father's will and purpose. Now, of course, for you and I to be filled with the Spirit, we first have to be emptied of self. We need to be yielded and surrendered. We use the term, we read it in Scripture, of death to self. And that, of course, involves active participation on our part. Our, our will needs to be engaged as we choose to surrender our control. We choose to make ourselves completely available and obedient to him in every category of our lives. The Lord Jesus would say on different occasions, we read it later here in Luke, where he says, you must take up your cross daily and follow me. We often think of and read this statement filled with the Holy Spirit, and we, we agree together that this is something that we would we would enjoy, that we would benefit from. But often we don't like to think of the corresponding reality that before we can be filled with the Spirit of God, we need to be emptied of self. And I wonder if you've taken the time in these days and in the last uh, weeks where we've been, uh, all of our activity has been, been uh, put to a stop. I wonder, have have we taken this opportunity as we get back to the basics to say, Lord, uh, here I am. I, I want you to have my mind. I, I want you to occupy my thought life. I'm not going to take all the time and read uh, all of the conspiracy theories. I'm not going to watch all of the, the YouTube things that are sent that are, uh, that are entering into the conspiracy of the hour. I want you to occupy my heart. I want you to have my heart, my affections, my desires. I want you to have my will. I want you to have my marriage, my children. I want you to have my present, my future, my career, my spare time, my bank account, my eating my sleeping, my ministry, my local church. See, for you and I to be filled with the Spirit of God, we need to first be emptied of self. Remember 
remember that scene when God was preparing Moses for service. He asked the question to Moses, what is that in your hand? Of course, Moses was a shepherd. He had the shepherd's staff. And you remember, you remember the command that God gave to Moses. He said, lay it down. Take that staff and, and lay it down. And I guess the question, as I think of this, the question that comes to my own heart is, what is it that I need to lay down? What is it in my life that, that I'm holding on to that I need to surrender and lay down? You remember what happened to Moses' staff, the shepherd's staff. Eventually it was taken up again and used for the glory of God repeatedly as the rod of God in his hand. And for our Heavenly Father to use this season for personal renovation and as he seeks to form the character and the beauty of Christ into our lives. It's only going to happen as we further surrender our lives to him. The filling and control, the leading of the Holy Spirit, it's not a one-time crisis event, but it's a, a daily, moment-by-moment -moment reality where the Holy Spirit moves into the space in our lives that we provide for him. Notice in these verses, it's, it's an interesting thing that the, the Lord Jesus, as he was filled and, and led by the Spirit, he was taken out into the wilderness. And of course, we've all heard messages about the, the wilderness experiences of so many of the greats uh, in Scripture. Uh, God took them out to the wilderness to uh, prepare them, to refine them. Uh, so many of the Lord's servants uh, have been taken to the wilderness. Perhaps I'm talking to some today who, or tonight who are in that wilderness experience even now. But it's interesting to notice that it's after the, the, the Lord Jesus is filled by the Spirit of God and that he's led by the Spirit of God. It's after that that we see the enemy turn his guns on the Lord Jesus. And perhaps there's a, a lesson, a principle there for us to observe that, that Satan takes special interest in, his, in those servants that are spirit-filled and led. The Christian who's living a compromised, unfocused, worldly kind of life, it's not much threat, likely not much spiritual warfare. But if this experience of the Lord Jesus is any lesson for us, and I believe it is, it's, it's when we enter into uh, this, this kind of life where we empty uh, our life of self and, and, and allow the Spirit of God to come in and take over and to control our life and to lead us along, it's then that we can expect, uh, we can expect uh, a fresh round of, of spiritual battle. Notice, of course, here the, the divine leading, the, the, the personal leading of the Holy Spirit in the life of the Lord Jesus. Of course, that's a, that's a birthright, the Apostle Paul says, uh, of the child of God, that the child of God um, will be led by the Spirit of God. We, we no longer need the, the fences of divine law to move us and to direct us, but we can enjoy the, the personal leading of the Spirit of God in our lives. That's, a, again, another whole topic for another day, but a, a wonderful privilege that we have as, as the children of God to be led personally through life uh, by God himself, a tailor-made path for our lives, uh, opening and closing doors and through circumstances and through the, the promptings of the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God and, and so on. He leads us and guides us through life. And so as we think of the Lord Jesus, first of all, we see uh, this one uh, implanted with divine life. The divine life was a characteristic of, of his sojourn here on earth. Divine control. He was filled. He was led by the Spirit of God. And, and then finally, uh, we notice just uh, down a few verses in chapter 4, in verse 14, after the temptation was over, 
this is Luke chapter four, rather, in verse 14. Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went out through all the surrounding region. Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit. I find it so interesting to see the and to observe the parallels between our Lord's earthly ministry in his physical body and the ministry that continues on today in his spiritual body. As we read the book of Acts, we see a remarkable parallels, and I've been enjoying just this little mini study personally, uh, comparing what took place and what we read about in the early chapters of Luke and, and then what we read in the early chapters of Acts. Uh, we, we see the, that the divine life is imparted. We, we see the anointing of the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, the, and, and then great power in Acts 4 and verse 32, we read that with great power, the apostles gave witness to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. What made the earthly life of the Lord Jesus so spectacular was not simply that he was a remarkable human being, which he was, of course, but, but that in his humanity, he was subject to and dependent upon the Holy Spirit in his life. It's been observed that in uh, this gospel that is devoted to um, presenting him as the son of the nine times the Holy Spirit is mentioned in relation to the life of the Lord Jesus. As we get to the end of the Gospel of Luke in chapter 4, we hear the Lord Jesus speaking to his disciples before he returned to heaven. And he, and he instructed his disciples and he said, tarry here in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. Why was it so important that they be endued or clothed with power from on high? Well, the fact is that their flesh needed to be covered. In a very real way, their, their, their flesh needed to be covered. We, we, we know that the flesh profits nothing. Uh, in the flesh, we can do nothing that pleases God. And of course, the Lord Jesus didn't have a sin nature to contend with. We, we discover that, or we, we, that's proven here in the uh, temptation of, of the Lord Jesus in chapter 4. It's not that... The Lord Jesus was able not to sin, but rather that he was not able to sin. He had no sin nature within him. But yet, in his perfect humanity, we see that he was anointed and filled and empowered with the Holy Spirit of God for service. As you read in the Gospel of Luke, or rather in, in the book of Acts, uh, one of the things you you see, and what and the reason why we enjoy reading this account in the Book of Acts, is that it was abundantly clear to all who observed then, and to all of us who observe now, that something well beyond the scope of mere humanity was taking place. You remember when the Sanhedrin, the authorities, opened an inquiry into what happened on one occasion. And, and the first question out of their mouths was, by what power or by what name have you done this? They didn't need to be a rocket scientist to figure it out. Something was going on, something outside of the ordinary. Even the unbeliever knew that there was a power being manifested that could not be explained through natural means. What a testimony when these fierce op uh, opponents of the gospel could look on and observe the activity of, of these Galilean fishermen, and they'd whisper among themselves, and this is in Acts 4 and verse 13, it's, it's obvious that a, that a miracle has been done. Uh, it's obvious to, and evident to all who dwell in Jerusalem. We can't deny it. 
as the Lord has been stripping back the layers of my life during this season, and some of it certainly has to do with uh, this worldwide pandemic and all of what has been my normal activity really has uh, ground to a halt in, in one sense. Um, but, but maybe there's another aspect to it as well that uh, in a couple of months I'll be turning 50. And, uh, and, and so it causes you to um, become more introspective, perhaps some would call it a midlife crisis where um, you, you start wrestling with things. Well, for me, it's just been a time of evaluation as I've been uh, just, just wondering how much of what I have done over the past 20 years uh, can be explained by natural means. How much of it has been a human effort? How much has, of it has been uh, just uh, evidence of the flesh at work? And, and how much truly has been in demonstration of the spirit and of power. I think it's good for us to evaluate our lives and our ministry in the light of what the Sanhedrin asked that day. By what power do you do these things? I expect many of you are, are, are like me. Once we've done something a few times, we say, I've, I've got this, I, I can do this. When we've done something hundred times, we don't even think about it. We just, we just go ahead and do it. It's so much part of the routine. I had a daughter who was fiercely independent. And when she was a little girl, the, the moment she could do something once, she'd push back our hands. She didn't want us to help her do it. Let me do it. Let me do it. How many thousands of times have we gone into our meetings? How many thousands of times have some of us preached messages? How many times have we gone out with the gospel? And it's become so routine, just a going through the motions. We know how to, to do it. We've done it before. Let me do it. Let me do it. We end up going out, we're going into our uh, meetings without the power of the Holy Spirit. Scott referred to that earlier. And we know it to be true. We, we, this is the, the story of, of the book of Acts, that without the power of the Holy Spirit, the church is an empty shell. The implanting, the filling, the empowering of the Holy Spirit of God is not a luxury. It's vital. It's essential to any service for God. One of the great sins of the church has been, and I think continues to be, to substitute attractions for power, where we're lacking power, where we're lacking the the supernatural and the evidence of God at work, we need to we need to come up with a plan B. And and so we start to get creative and add attractions and add different things uh, simply to make up for the lack of Holy Spirit power. I often think of that scene in Ezekiel where we read of the the, the presence of God, the Shekinah glory of God uh, departing from the temple. And it's not even the fact that, that the spirit of, or the, the presence of God is departing from the temple that is so sobering for me. What I find sobering as you go on to read that account is that it seems that nobody noticed. They, they continued on with their activity and and it seemed that no one noticed that the presence of God, the power of God, the blessing of God had departed from their presence. As we watch the unfolding effects of this coronavirus, and we hear things about the second wave coming at some point, and as I'm mentioned before there's the videos that are circulated and the and the articles that are written about who's to blame and the evils of our government 
And let's not miss the fact that the work, the work of God continues in your life and mine. And just as we're reminded by Brother Scott at the beginning, uh, the heart of God towards us is for good. And, and he is intent on using this season to further conform us to the image of his son. And if you're honest, uh, as I need to be before you, uh, there is a great deal of sanctifying work that needs to continue, that he needs to accomplish in our lives in order that we would be sanctified completely, spirit, soul, and body. And so as we think of, of this stripping away of, of all of the layers of activity and all of the uh, agendas we have and all of our priorities and everything, it's good for us to go back to the essentials, go back to the basics. And I, I think a good place to go is here to the early chapters of, of Luke, where we see what it was in the life of the Lord Jesus uh, that set him apart for service and set him apart to be one who uh, lived out his life of fully pleasing his heavenly father. But we see, of course, divine life. Uh, he wasn't just Jesus of Nazareth. He was the Son of God. He was the eternal Son, the one who pleased the Father. It's not just Randy Hoffman that is going out to, to, to do the work. I, I have been made a child of God. I have had the, the very life, the Spirit of God implanted within me. And, and I share in, in, as we read in, in Ephesians, all of the spiritual blessing of the heavenlies in Christ, and made uh, heir and, and joint heir, even with Jesus Christ himself. What an amazing thing God has done when he implanted life, divine life, into uh, you, into me, uh, as his children. Let's never, let's never be satisfied with living an ordinary life a natural life. Um, he has something so much more for us. Divine life, divine control, have I handed over to him the steering wheel of my life? Have I surrendered to him? Have I offered all of these different areas I was mentioning before? Uh, my mind, am I filling my mind with with him and, and, and things that would please him? Have I, have I given to him my heart, my affections, or am I like what we read about in, in, in Jeremiah 2, where uh, we forsake the fountain of living waters and we go off and we find satisfaction in other things? If so, uh, let's, let's take this opportunity to repent and turn back to him and offer our hearts and our affections to him, our will, uh, our obedience, and, and all that is every category of our life, uh, yielded over to him, surrendered to him for his, for his filling and for his glory. And then our uh, divine power, um, are we dependent upon him? Or have we been so uh, comfortable just carrying on uh, in, the, in the strength of our flesh? Um, just just going on with our own uh, natural resources, um, doing things um, our own way uh, for our own pleasure. May this be a time where we come back to him and say, Lord, uh, there's no possible way that I can go forward and accomplish your work apart from Holy Spirit power. And I trust that uh, this will be a a wonderful time in our lives that we'll be able to look back in a coming day and say the Lord did a wonderful work in my life uh, during these these days and weeks when everything was turned upside down. It was a time where he uh, drew me back to himself, brought me back to the basics, um, and uh, I recognized the tremendous um, the tremendous privilege of of the life being implanted within my physical body, divine life, divine control, um, and, and finally, divine power. Let's pray. Father, as we continue in your presence here this evening, we are just so grateful for the life of the Lord Jesus. Uh, we see um, 
in him, uh, one who fully did your will, one who completed the work that you gave him to do, one uh, who was fully surrendered and yielded to all that you had for him. And Father, we, we just recognize that there is so much about us that is unlike him, and we recognize that this is a season that you can use uh, to, to continue this transforming work in our lives. We are so grateful for that wonderful statement that we read about in Philippians, that he who began a good work in us will be faithful to complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. And so again, we just offer ourselves to you afresh. Uh, Lord, would you strip away all that is not of you, and would you take us back to uh, to yourself and to and to the basics, the essentials of the life that you have for us. We thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that has now been entrusted to us. You have not only implanted uh, with us, uh, rather given us uh, eternal life, uh, but you have given us the power to live that life even now. And so uh, we ask for your blessing as we continue on. We pray this in our Savior's name. Amen.